Hello, and welcome to Baha'i Blogcast with me, your host, Rain Wilson. This is where I interview members of the Baha'i faith and other friends from all over the world about their hearts and minds and souls, their spiritual journeys, what they're interested in, and what makes them tick. Enjoy. Hello, Baha'i Blogcast listeners. It's me, Rain Wilson. Uh, super thrilled to be with you today. It's a, it's a sweltering day in Hollywood, California. <laughs> I have a, a new guest that I'm really excited about. This is a person that I don't know at all, but I feel like I've known for, for decades and really excited to engage in a conversation with her. Kamal Sinclair is joining me today. And I mean, there's too much to say about you in an introduction, so I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna shovel it in as we go. But you have worked in film development, you've worked in virtual reality, you've been a performer, you're an actor, you're a percussionist. Your uh, the your job skill set is so vast. But I'm gonna I'm gonna start backwards. Okay. I'm gonna start with your current job because it has this new foundation or whatever the hell it is that you're working on, <laughs> has the coolest name uh, of all time. And uh, what, what is this, this new venture? <laughs> That's my favorite introduction. I'm probably going to put that in my personal digital memoir uh, that Rain Wilson gave me that intro. Um, yes, I'm really excited to be able to be the new executive director of the Guild of Future Architects. Um, Future Architects. Future Architects. It sounds like a punk band or it- something. <laughs> It kind of is. It is a little punk, I must say. Um, this is kind of a, a vision of Sharon Chang, who's an incredible philanthropist. She comes out of technology and media, um, and she's been kind of approaching the whole work of social justice and impact investing and social entrepreneurship from a very different lens than the traditional kind of status quo lens. She invests in... Um, story first and in people first versus business model and kind of metrics first. Um, And her goal is to support people that are out there in the world working to make the world more beautiful. And she uses beauty very specifically because within beauty, you have justice. Within beauty, you have coordination, collaboration, curiosity, creativity, Unity. unity. She's, and I think it's a kind of a wonderful goal. And like, for example, I was at um, the design school in Stanford a couple of months ago, and we were talking about design thinking, uh, which is a huge kind of movement that came out many years ago. IDEO is a, one of the key uh, organizations that has evangelized the idea of design thinking. But it's still at its core trying to design for consumers, the whole consumer. But in the end, we're still defined as consumers. And so me and this guy from the design school where this design thinking and IDEO kind of emerged from said, well, what about designing for prosperity, which is more than just the consumer. It's looking at the whole ecosystem of how, you know, well-being and resources to support well-being come into play. And then he said to me, he said, actually, I think the most, you know, kind of best way to focus our efforts at designing the future is to design for beauty. And I said, ding, ding, ding. That's kind of the next phase of my life is to support the people out there in the world, whether they're coming from the arts or the sciences, technology, philanthropy, policy. How do we think about moving beyond this kind of consumer-based capitalist criteria for what looks like effectiveness, like GDP versus um, the kind of happiness index of a country, Mm -hmm. um, and kind of shift to uh, designing for beauty, which brings in a much broader set of um, factors. And this is a critical time that we have to make this shift and this mindset shift because we're entering into what they're calling the fourth industrial revolution, which is four different kinds of technologies that are gonna make some major disruptions. Uh, That's artificial intelligence, bioengineering, immersive media, and the decentralized web or the internet of things. Um, But the biggest aspect of this is that AI in particular is shifting us to a abundance condition where we no longer have to operate from scarcity based mentalities. So if you're talking about, you know, whatever 60,000 years of, you know, our survival mechanisms, thinking about scarcity, thinking about hoarding resources, thinking about a lot of the things that kind of came into the current models of how communities and societies work, AI 
if used with the right kinds of value systems and wielded in, in a just and unified way, and one that thinks about equity, equality, and prosperity, you're actually shifting to have to negotiate something that is a surplus technology um, that can sustainably organize the world's resources in a way that is in balance with the earth. Mm. And this is very different. Capitalism, all the systems that we know now have to do a major mindset shift. And when you think about how do we, what is maybe one of those goals that can drive us to that abundance is how do we design for beauty? Um, that's amazing. First of all, you're very smart. I feel a little intimidated right now. <laughs> I feel so. the same way. <laughs> so I thought, well, that's a lot of reason um, to it. But so many things you said just resonated there. Uh, I'm struck by the idea of beauty as the kind of inspiration and organizing factor for the kind of work this organization is doing. It's funny, my uncle is a professor in Idaho, uh, Dr. Rhett Diesner, and he's finishing his a book that he's publishing on beauty. And he's studied beauty for the last 30 years. Wow. And he studies it in terms of how expansive beauty is, how beauty is science, yes. how beauty is spirituality, how beauty runs through the arts, how beauty can enter our lives, how the... How God really, in a, if you look on a more mystical level, God is beauty itself. Mm, yes. You know, if you mm -hmm. stop thinking about God as an entity, like a being, like an old white guy <laughs> up, up in the sky going like, Kamal, you're a jerk. <laughs> but you think of God as the, the quintessence of beauty, you know, yeah. and there's so many mystical writings in the faith that support that. And, mm -hmm. and Shogi Effendi's... Uh, writings on beauty and, and the importance of the aesthetics and um, and you know, all the mystical writings of Baha'u'llah, the idea and the quintessence of beauty and uh, the pinnacle of beauty. and Because uh, in beauty there is unity and harmony and that unity and harmony is what Baha'is strive for and the and the beauty of the of humanity is its beauty in diversity and mm -hmm. its unity in diversity. Um, yeah. I and I know I'm preaching and not to be not to be a little bit you know that was such a beautiful uh, eloquent description of beauty. I mean, beauty is a vehicle to transcendence. Uh, beauty is a way to connect to the sublime. Um, and really, as you know, we're at an, we have a window of opportunity right now to invest in human potential in a way that we've never done. Um, I think we've been more afraid of human potential and people in in this kind of competitive mindset that that when you're operating from a scarcity-based mentality and a competitive-only mentality, you're not investing in other people's potential because that becomes a potential threat to you. I mean, that's obviously, I'm not, that's not obviously humanity across the board, but there's those elements that have been part of how we've structured um, our societies up until now. But this idea of investing in human potential um, allows for a mode of enlightenment and us to kind of go to the next level of the advancement of civilization. Um, I g I'll give you a more concrete example. Okay. Um, I was, uh, had the you know, privilege of being at the World Economic Forum in China, in Dalian, China in 2017, and I was on a panel with um, you know, a Yale professor, one of the top roboticists and AI specialists at a Hong Kong university. Um, uh, got to the, C the kind of, one of the head executives or CEO of Infosystems, and uh, the president of Baidu, which is the largest search engine in China, mm. one of the most powerful men in China. Um, and it was quite intimidating. <laughs> we, wow. We, were, we had 400 people in the room and it was going out to, I think, 4 million on streaming. Oh my God. And I was like, how the heck did I end up on this panel? I'm a dancer. <laughs> like, you were in stomp. I was in stomp. Like, it was the most you, surreal. You were... You were... <laughs> You were an expert at banging on garbage cans. And garbage cans. Yes. Wearing thrift. I could go to a thrift shop and I could bust out a stomp costume. Like I was an excellent, how do you look grungy, you know, uh, stylist. <laughs> and I was sitting on here literally right across from the president of Baidu. You know, I'm like, ugh. there were so many moments in my journey that I'm just like, how the heck did I end up here? Um, and we can talk about that. But, you know, going back to this example... Um, the big question was, should we unleash AI? Because it has such, such exponential power. Um, who gets to regulate globally? Like, how are we, you know, because right now the power is going to a very few people that are basically creating the whole um, infrastructure for how AI operates. And there's a lot of, already a lot of 
huge inequities that are coming out of that mm. uh, it, that structure, um, inclu- including biased algorithms and some from malicious things like what we're seeing in Russia, some things uh, in, in the American elections and some things that are completely accidental from blind spots, like just not having people on your team that could you know, raise their hand and say, hey, have we thought about you know, this? Um, but anyway, so we're on this panel and we're also talking about the future of work because if you haven't been part of this conversation, you know, the predictions are that 79% of current work will be outmoded by 2030. That's, that's insane. <laughs> I, uh, that's, I mean, that's crazy. I've been reading about this a lot. Who's that uh, Israeli professor who wrote Sapiens? He, uh, he writes Yuval about Harari. Yeah, yeah, he writes about it a lot. And, um, you know, Elon Musk talks about it, but we're so close I was just watching a documentary on um, truckers and then they were talking about how, you know, 10 or 20 years, we're not going to need people to drive trucks. No. All of those truckers are going to be out of work. That's just one very specific example. And taxis and Ubers. Um, Yeah, exactly. I mean, another specific example is, you know, four years ago, a company um, created an algorithm that could basically go through the entire history of um, legal precedents and basically pull out the exact arguments that a lawyer needs to bring into court for their case, kind of making paralegals, you know, wow. outdated. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of things like that. But Maybe we'll have robot lawyers in the future. <laughs> you know, that would be much better. <laughs> I would, that's a role that I could play really well is uh, robot lawyer. You know? I think you could. Uh, yeah. I mean, Objection, you know your honor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I wish I had to come back for that, but I don't. Um, so anyway, going back to this panel, you know, we were talking about, well, how do we deal with the future of work? And the president of Baidu looked at me and he said, well, we're so happy Sundance is here because this is when I was representing Sundance. Because uh, when there's no more work for everybody, we'll, we'll have film and gaming to keep them busy. And I was like, like immediately had this like, dystopic image in my head oh my of just God. like pure opiate of the masses. That's like Ready like... Player Ready Player One. Did you <laughs> yeah, see that or read I that did, book? Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. been like the Bible in the virtual reality world. Yeah. <laughs> Coming up to that we'll we'll talk about that later. But man, and I so I had this like sucker punch to the gut, like, oh my God. And I also there was a I mean a palpable, not everybody, but there was a palpable fear of of all these people without work and for you know privileged elite, you like kind of like a French Revolution moment, like Oh, eat, let them eat cake. Let them let them consume film and, and gaming. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like this kind of opiate of the masses. Let them play Fortnite. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but then, right next to him uh, was the Infosystems executive, and he said, "Look, I've already outmoded eleven percent of my workforce to AI. That's eleven percent of two hundred fifty thousand employees. So Holy it's a moly. pretty considerable number." He said, "But instead of firing them, I put them in an imagination department." to imagine our future. Wow. And so for me, we have a choice ahead of us of like, you know, it, it continuing to kind of divest in human potential or force people into um, kind of patterns that serve a corporate need or, you know, kind of an elitist or privileged need to actually investing, taking the time and the, the kind of reduction of labor in traditional sense to allow people to kind of in, in mine the gems, their virtues, their own creative potentials, their particular gifts that God has given them to bring into the world and unleash human potential on a level we've never seen in human mm. history. Mm. Never. And so what does that mean? I mean, in the writings, it talks about how we're kind of still babies and toddlers. I mean, we're, we're adolescents. We're at yeah, the adolescent yeah. stage. Mm-hmm. Could you imagine with this technology releasing us from certain kinds of repetitive, in some ways undignified or demeaning labor, um, especially when they're contextualized in those terms, and allowing us the freedom to kind of really expand human potential. I, I can't even imagine what that means for 100 years from now. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. Um, so let's go, let's go back. Let's back this up yeah. a little bit. <laughs> we dove right into the deep stuff, which I like to do sometimes on this podcast. And I thank the 137 people who have tuned in to listen to this. Hi, everyone. Um, so, you grew up on a ranch in Costa Rica <laughs> with Jimmy Seals, <laughs> and in the, in a family uh, in the '80s uh, as as Baha'i pioneers. Is that how you were? Is that how you grew up? Tell me about that. <laughs> yes, I I grew up with like the most you know '60s '70s version of the American Baha'is that you can imagine. An interracial couple. Um, my dad became a Baha'i, um, his story is quite 
legendary. Um, he like if he hadn't left a, a room that he was in and ran to a high fireside and declared himself, he would have been shot and killed. So that was like, you know, just a lot of, you know, kind of mystical stuff happening there. Um, and yeah, my dad was best friends with Sills and Croft back in those days. And I, that was the height of um, Sills and Croft's popularity. And when Jimmy decided to give it all up and to leave the music business and, and, and fame and all that behind. He had a beautiful ranch in Costa Rica and he was a pioneer. So my dad and my family joined him and we lived on one of the houses on the ranch. Uh, I was... What happens on a Costa Rican ranch? What are you, <laughs> what are you ranching there? Well, there were horses and there were cows. Okay. Um, I was three, so I remember like coral snakes, scorpions, tarantulas, oh iguanas bats, uh, avocado trees. <laughs> so my world, my version of Costa Rica was very much about the animals and <laughs> very uh, close to nature. Um, his children also lived on the ranch, so we had a lot of fun escapades. The jungle was right on the edge of it, so we would just kind of walk into the jungle and go on uh, kind of, you know, these treks to go see the monkeys. It was, it was kind of ideal. And Costa Rica is so... It's such an amazing country because they put so much priority into the environmental preservation. And um, they, they, there's so much wildlife. There's so much flora and fauna because yeah. of that. You, I, we spent a couple of weeks walking around, just walking through jungles. And so I saw creatures that I just have never could mm. imagine. Yeah. And that was my, that was my childhood. Just always... Did you ever see a tapir? I had never, I do not remember seeing a tapir. I probably They're did They're nocturnal, see a so it's hard. Oh, that's it's probably like why. My, my wife's favorite animal, a tapir, but they're really hard to see. <laughs> I learned about tapirs from Dora the Explorer for my kids, so I wish I had the reflection of going to see them in, when I lived in Costa Rica. Yeah, so I remember my dad and Jimmy would kind of go on these treks into the jungle for months at a time uh, to go meet with the Talamac and Indian uh, community way up in the mountains and there uh, was a whole Baha'i community there so they would oh my gosh they would bring they had LSA and they would bring them the kind of correspondence from the House of Justice and stay there for a while and pray with them and you know do uh, deepenings and firesides and things like that but it was just a and, and there was did Jimmy bring his guitar and sing like Hummingbird to them I wonder <laughs> or at least a ukulele or something <laughs> you know I wish I knew that because all I remember was my dad one time coming back from one of those treks at like midnight and banging on our door. And when my mom opened the door, he kind of fell in and he had like uh, leech oh, marks no. and stuff. And they had used diesel to get the leeches off. But he was exhausted. And I don't even remember him having a backpack. So I'm sure he had a backpack, but he just fell like this like... <laughs> black guy with the afro out of here coming out of the jungle and just like leech marks everywhere oh and smelling God. like diesel. <laughs> oh man, that's crazy. That's um, crazy. But it was, it was a, I think it was a really wonderful experience to be um, in that environment in my early childhood uh, mm. years. It gave me a sense of not being just an American, but being more of an international world citizen. citizen. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Like a mm -hmm. world citizen. It gave me, a sense of connection to the sublime relationship of nature. Mm. Um, the, and there was a, there was a kind of a flow state, a, you know, kind of spiritual energy around the whole mission and the unity of the community, of the group of people that we were engaged with Emma Dickey, uh, George, her cousin, like all these Baha'is that were Americans that had come to Costa Rica as well as the Costa Rican Baha'is, um, that we were in uh, community with. And so, you know, I lived as a child in Nicaragua. I didn't know that. So from, Three to five ish. I was in Bluefields, Nicaragua, on the Caribbean wow. coast. We have this in the common same too. Thing. Oh yes, my god! We both God. also went to NYU acting <laughs> school, so uh, <laughs> we have a lot to talk about. Um, wow, that's that's really uh, that's 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 a beautiful story. And then, in not much longer after that, you went to Southeast Asia and New Zealand as a twelve and thirteen year old artist performing with an arts group. And you met Rohia Kanum, I, I understand. Did. So uh, what is what is that adventure? That's, that was... that's awfully young. <laughs> I know. Now be... I have a 13-year-old, yeah. and I'm like, what were my parents thinking? <laughs> they oh, so they didn't come with they you? They're like... No, nobody came with me. I They put me on a plane at 12 by myself to go be on tour in Southeast Asia with an Australian, you know, Baha'i arts group. And, uh, and now that I have a 13-year-old, I was like... 
I, I, you know, I'm just like, I mean, they said they just had faith. <laughs> I don't recommend necessarily that kind of faith because I got lucky. (laughs) Sometimes I would love to put my 14-year-old son on a plane (laughs) to like Guam or Nepal. And be like, okay, kid. (laughs) No internet service. Figure it out. Yeah, that was kind of how it was. Um, I was was performing with the Baha'i Youth Workshop in Los Angeles in in the 80s. And uh, my my parents helped to start the Baha'i Youth Workshop in, in LA. So my older brother and sister, Tony Sinclair and Lisa Sinclair, were in that workshop. I grew up you know, from three years old, just kind of in the back with my disco skirt, trying to like keep up. (laughs) And um, so I, by that time I was, you know, in the workshop, I had been training as a dancer. um, So I had some skills, I guess. (laughs) Actually, Naime Heath, who could sing like a bird. Yeah, sure. uh, She was just the most beautiful singer. I can't even tell you. They had actually approached, um, basically the House of Justice was looking for, uh, a youth to join the Wildfire Theater Group that was had been on tour in Southeast Asia for a year as pa- part of an Entry by Troops initiative. And so one of their troop members had to leave, um, and they still had about like three more months of the tour left. And so they wanted somebody that could dance. They wanted somebody that was, you know, because uh, they were all, you know, white. They wanted somebody that was from a different ethnic background. Mm-hmm. And so they actually invited Naime to come, especially because she could sing and dance, double threat, um, but she couldn't go. And so I don't know if she recommended me or somebody else recommended me. I was 12 years old at the time. And I get a call from, you know, the International Teaching Center saying, hey, can you want to come to Southeast Asia for three months? And, oh, my God. <laughs> and come. I was like, uh, and, oh, but you know what? So I should back it up. That summer, I had gone with the Baha'i Youth Workshop to Atlanta on a teaching trip. And I saw for the first time someone declare that I had I had taught the faith to. Oh, wow. And, and I was 12 years old. And it had struck me so deeply to have seen that process and know I got to be a part of it that um, I got... Uh, I came home and I was telling my sister that I really wanted to see, you know, entry by troops, right? This whole thing. Everyone always talked about entry by troops. I was yeah. like, I want to see this. So I, I, I basically said a bunch of prayers and um, got on my knees and I begged God t- to see other countries because I really wanted to get out of my American bubble. Sure. I wanted to see entry by troops and I wanted to be of service through the arts. And I was 12 years old saying these prayers a week. I told my dad about it. I came out of the very intense prayer session, told my father about it, came out a week later. I get a call from the International Teaching Center to go to Southeast Asia to be part of an arts troupe. And they had already experienced, um, you know, masses of people coming into the faith through their work. Wow. <laughs> it was like literally a week later. So it was the Wildfire Theater Company out of Australia, and then they were touring around Southeast Asia. What mm-hmm. kind of theater would they do? Just as a theater um, artist, I'm, yeah, it's I'm a good curious. Theater. Is it, um, you know, a play or? It was It was more like a, a, a like kind of a sketch artist, musical band. The the theater troupe in Australia, which was a much bigger group, did have proper plays and, the, and were much more developed. But this was a skinny crew of only five. Oh, wow. Yeah, and it was singing, dancing, um, you know, a lot of... They had written uh, original songs and original choreography, um, but nobody was really... There was only one other dancer out of the five, so me and Monty Ain were the, uh, the two dancers. And yeah, it was mostly songs about unity and all, you know, all the kind of Baha'i principles and so forth and a couple of sketches. So you would go into a town and what would happen? Um, so we got, we, we got booked like a bus and truck tour um, of, the, you know, I would say we got booked in a lot of, it, well, actually we got mobbed like we were Michael Jackson. Like it was the surrealist thing because this is, you know, this is kind of pre-opening up to the Western world. So even seeing, you know, Westerners sing, uh, you know, we go to like, you know, a girl's school with like 3,000 girls and we would get mobbed for autographs and literally be on the ground trying to sign autographs. We could like chase down the street and we weren't very good. So <laughs> it was surreal. I was like, they must be like Baha'u'llah goggles are on all these people because <laughs> not good um but yeah we just did hip-hop and sang you know kind of pop and r&b stuff and 
and did comedy sketches that translated the language barrier and yeah. got mobbed. Yeah. <laughs> crazy Amazing. and was it in conjunction with like a Baha'i meeting and you'd say hey later tonight we're gonna have a Baha'i meeting or no it was more like a just a band tour there was a great moment where um, when we were in Hong Kong we were actually performing regularly in the Vietnamese refugee camps um, through the Save the Children Fund which mm. uh, there was a Baha'i and that worked there and mm. was booking us and that was for a 12 year old um, incredibly humbling experience there would be you know 5,000 people inside of a single detention center or refugee camp that were misplaced and uh, or for political reasons couldn't return home and all the, you know, the whole post-Vietnam uh, nightmare. And um, they put together tables for us to dance on. We did get, we brought in our little PA systems. We would go into the, t- the, the camp tents where they were living and it would be a full family to a plywood board that was like, you know, eight by three. Um, and they would be stacked three high. Uh, we would have, this one guy had nothing more important in the world than independent freedom tattooed on his chest like there was just this they, wow. would, they were sometimes we had to cancel gigs because they would go into uh, hunger strikes to try to you know rebel against um, some of the conditions I mean it was just such a and that's where the that first was time, that was inconvenient you're like oh man our, our gig is canceled everyone's on a hunger, hunger strike, strike. How, how rude it don't was, they know that we've rehearsed for months for this <laughs> look at them so uh, so, but give them a sandwich and let us perform. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna push the line on a Baha'i podcast of how <laughs> how insensitive I can be just to to keep my listeners on their toes. No. I, and I also love the angry letters and emails. Oh yeah, please. Send so them in. anyway, um, so how does Rohia Kanum fit into this? In a, the first time I met her, she was sitting at, at one of our performances in the Vietnamese refugee camp. Wow. Um, she was surrounded by probably about 500 uh, refugees, and her and Violette Nachavani were just sitting right there in the middle of it. And I was so nervous. You talk about nervous before mm. going on stage. I've never been as nervous as knowing I had to perform for Ria Kanum. Like, I was like, oh, you know, I was like just saying prayers. I was like, get it together, you know. And we have, like, stuff in there, like, we're shimming and, like, some of the stuff. And I was like, is this going to be proper to dance like this in front of Ria Kanum? You know, like, this little 12-year-old mind, right? So we performed, and then we went off stage to change because it was very hot and sweaty. Um, and I was the first one to get changed uh, and go out to meet her. Um, and they were rushing us because she had to go. Um, and so I ran, and I got to her car, uh, and, and the car, the door, the kind of shaded windows were up. And I, I was the only one. And I got to the car door, and she rolled down the window and held my hand mm. with a tear in her eye. And she's because she had been following their work for the full year because she mm. was she was in Hong Kong or doing an Asian tour at the time she held my hand and she goes now it is complete now now this work will be complete because you know I was a woman of, I was a girl of color I was uh, bringing in uh, kind of I guess the missing piece of the puzzle oh. and uh, and she and the fact she had a tear in her eye and held oh. my hand um, and then That's we got beautiful. and we got a couple of more then she invited us to her um, her apartment and hosted us for dinner. She gave me a watch on my birthday. Do you um, still have the watch? I, I actually donated it to the house. Um, it's in the archives now. Wow. Yeah. Uh, actually, I didn't do it. Mona, Mes- Mona, Mona and Sina Mosayev did it because I gave it to them when they went pioneering to South Africa right after apartheid fell. Um, that was my gift to them as they went to go pioneer. And and they donated it to the house when the house called for archives around Rehe uh, mm-hmm. service and life. Um, I'm donating a Dwight bobblehead. <laughs> that will be cherished to the uh, to the Baha'i archives. <laughs> it's funny too because it's a really cheap watch. <laughs> uh, just some Timex it's just a little, from an yeah, airport, but like you know, like, like uh, some vendors, I think. But yeah, it was precious because it was uh, you know oh. given to me by Ray Canoe. All right, so let's flash forward a little bit here um, from twelve year old uh, wildfire performer. Then you decide to become a performing artist and go to NYU and study acting. Uh, That's right. What, what, what happened there? Well, you know, I was part of an arts family. Uh, my father had always been a great advocate of the power of the arts as one of the kind of wings, sciences and the arts that are the wings of civilization and advancement of civilization. So from the you know early days of the Baha'i Workshop into... I always wanted to be a dancer. That was like clear as day. So I trained in LA at Hollywood Dance Studios. And then um, 
I went to LA County High School for the Arts for theater, and there, you know, NYU or Juilliard were like the two paths to go. Mm -hmm. um, and Juilliard felt a little bit. Um, I didn't audition because I felt like I was a little bit more experimental than that, not mm -hmm. as traditional. And uh, so I went to Tisch, and I was in the experimental theater wing at Tisch. Oh, good for you. <laughs> and were you focusing more on on dancing or acting, or you kind of wanted to do both? Both. I got an opportunity to direct in high school, and so that really gave me the bug of you know, having a dance background and a theater background, because I t took theater in high school, um, I really wanted to be able to integrate both into my practice. So experimental theater seemed like the best route to go because it was such a physical theater style, um, but still very rigorous in terms of language and in terms of story structure and in terms of, you know, character development. So that's how I ended up at Tisch. Um, I was there for a year. Uh, my friend who went to Juilliard, uh, Damien, he said, hey, uh, there's this show Stomp. Uh, do you want to you want, you want to come down and watch it? They have an audition tomorrow. And I was like, oh, I don't have $40 to pay for that ticket. I was a starving NYU yeah. student. Mm -hmm. And he goes, I'll pay for you. And so he took me to the show and then he forced me. And I was looking, I was like in the third row and there was like this phenomenal group of like virtuosic dancer, drummer, people, comedians. And I was like... I can't do that. You know, like, that's just, like, completely... I don't have that skill set. So he forced me to stay out in front of the Orthe Orpheum Theater until um, uh, the cast members came out. And two of them were former ETW students from Tisch. And so Amina Kaplan, and, and they were like, yeah, you should audition. They'd never seen me. I'm, like, just a random kid on the street. Yeah. They're like, come on, you should audition tomorrow. Da -da -da. They'd, like, pump me up. And I was like, well it's an experience. Like, you know, if I do this, I'm going to be auditioning. Like I had this whole, you know, kind of dream of the kind of actor I was going to be. And uh, I was like, this will like get my feet wet and how, what's it like to audition for theater in New York. So I just did it as an experiment and, yeah. and I got the gig mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> using Bayou the Workshop step dancing moves. Oh, nice. <laughs> and then I was with the, the troupe for six years. Thank you, Oscar DeGruy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for six years? Six years, yeah. And were you performing in their downtown location or the tour or both? Yeah, both. Um, I was at the Orpheum uh, for the first year. Then I was on tour for two years nationally. And then I started going on international tours. Um, I decided after the two, and a, two plus years on the road that I wanted to go back to NYU to finish my degree. So um, they had me as a swing in New York. So I only had to do three to six shows a week rather than oh, that's great. eight shows a week. That's great. And so I, I used my stomp money to pay through for my NYU. Did you do some theater work at NYU uh, that really like turned you on and blew your mind? What were some projects you were involved in? Uh, well, we did a lot of Brecht. We did a lot yeah, of... Um, I did a lot of Brecht. A lot of Grotowski. I did all that. I did that. <laughs> Yeah. A lot of Meisner. Did you do plastiques? We did a lot of plastiques. I actually really love plastiques. I love plastiques. I was like, it, it kind of reminds me, okay, to make a spiritual connection between pl plastiques and virtue development. Okay. You know, the idea of plastiques. So plastiques for those, oh no, yeah, go, go ahead. for it. No, you, you're the. So you're, you probably know more than me because I only did a couple workshops on them, but um, it's a way of um, using specific movements of the body, uh, iso body iso movement isolations in the body that release feelings both for the performer and the viewer yes and so there was this one exercise that we used to do where you know basically part of it is to let yourself go as deep as you can with the particular emotion you're feeling at the time and let it like be very kind of in your body on your face and I, I just remember that exercise that the teacher kept saying if you go all the way to anger like don't try to go anywhere else just go as deep as you can in anger then it eventually leads you to laughter leads you to sad like the idea that they're all the emotions are connected and they're ah. never static. They're never stuck. They're this, they, they literally lead like doors one to the other, one to the other, one to the other. And I felt like even with the idea of designing for beauty, like as we've been developing this, this organization, we were trying to get down to what are the essential kind of virtues of this organization that we need to like put in our value statement. And I said, you know, if we focus on beauty, it will lead to every other thing. Because if you really want beauty, if you really, really focus on beauty, it leads to justice. Yeah. Yes. If you really focus on justice, it leads to, to, to kindness. If you really focus on kindness, it leads to courage. Like there's no way. And I remember that as a young Baha'i trying to, you know, kind of do the virtues development that I would literally go, um, I had a, like an internal practice where I would go to 
um, high school every morning and in my homeroom, I would find one, I would identify one kind of virtue that each person in my classroom embodied in some way. Wow. Just so I could like orient myself to that way of thinking yeah. instead of like their negative qualities. But in my own practice, I would pick a virtual week that I would really focus on. I was like, okay, this week I'm going to work on, you know, courage. And it was really interesting as a practice. You could never just focus on courage. It always sprung open into yeah. all these other virtues. Yeah. So that's kind of what plastics is to me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. So what happened afterwards? You, you graduate. This is kind of where I have a gap in your, in in your my... chronology before, uh, before you were at the Sundance well, Labs. It, it, was, it, was, Institute. it was kind of like, a, so I was doing Stomp. I was finishing my BFA at NYU and I was starting a theater company. All at the same time. Oh, you started a theater company. Yeah, so I had a theater company called Universal Arts, and we did uh, a number of plays that uh, got... We were at the kind of hip-hop theater before hip-hop theater had a definition. Sure. It was definitely the fusion of dance and spoken word and... Uh, did you and work with Savion Glover at actually, all? Actually, yeah, Bakari Wilder uh, mm-hmm. from Savion Glover's troupe and Jason. Uh, we, we had um, a lot of the noise funk crew, because it was like all of us young noise funk crew and all of us young stomp crew... Were and the Blue Man Group and uh, Boogie Down Productions, the Rocksteady crew. Like we were all doing this thing in downtown and it was within the art scene in in New York at the in the late '90s. And we kind of just kept fusing and merging. It was such a vibrant community. Oh my God, it was brilliant. We had just we would go into a, a studio and we would have like you know ten dancers, five musicians, a couple spoken word artists, and we would just like create something within an hour that ended up on stage a month later like it was oh, just wow. crazy the energy the prolific we were just just making work making work making work it was one of the most rich spiritual flow states mm. i've mm. ever been in mm-hmm. intellectually rigorous all about social justice and a lot of fun yeah that's <laughs> had great. A great time and were you able to keep unity in your troupe in your, yeah, in we your were, theater company? We had a really strong, mm-hmm. really unified group. Um, we, we ended up... So we did a show called The Beat. We did a show that was about this kind of like how music theory 101 or like if you go like kind of the, the kind of using music as an analogy for a spiritual journey, like set very seven valleys, four valleys, you know, but really funky. And we had like ooh, tap dancing and oh my God, it's like funk hoofing, not just tap dancing. It was really hot. So if we were going to use theater as a tool to change the world, if the arts are going to spread the Baha'i faith like wildfire, what would that theater look like in your opinion? <sighs> That's a really good question. Um, well, two, two things uh, that sprung to mind, and we'll see if this goes, in, goes anywhere to answer your question. I went a couple of years ago to a conference called the Allied Media Conference in Detroit. This is an organization that is so deeply rooted in unity, diversity, and justice. It was humbling as a Baha'i to walk into that environment and witness actual, true unity and diversity, true diversity in a way that I had never seen in the Baha'i community, mm. which is really saying something. Mm. You had every kind of race, ethnic group. You had every religious uh, group re- represented. You had uh, all kinds of all kinds of identity. You know, there was a strong trans community, LGBTQ community. There was uh, the Black Lives Matter troops where people were there. There was like, you know, the kind of white bread, you know, mid, 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 Midwest, you mm-hmm. know, boys. Like my uh, ancestors. Yeah. And the thing that I loved about it is that it actually had a real safe space for everyone without this kind of um, assimilation of everyone, having to uh, code switch out of who they really authentically are. And there was tension in the room. Like there was tension between a, a group of feminists uh, that weren't letting in trans women into the group. And so they, but instead of it just being this like conflict or something that they kind of shoved under the rug, they had a real dialogue about it. They weren't afraid of having the conversation mm. and asking the questions. It was the first time I'd been in a place where the love was held in, in, and the respect and the dignity was held and the acceptance and the safety was held and the, the conflict was able to be fully processed. How, do the, how are they able to do that when you can't do that on, a, on your basic college campus these days where it's like if you don't agree with my certain you know, viewpoint... Uh, on anything, then you are you're a perpetrator and and a bully. And I'm not just talking about. I'm talking like within 
groups. Yeah, you know, even within. I'm not just talking about like the white patriarchy yeah. subjugating other people. I'm just talking about, you know, the just inner human group condition. Dynam- yeah, dynamics. Yeah, inner condition. Absolutely. I mean, I... So how were they able to do that? And you, you can't know, do that at Reed College. I wish I had the exact formula, but this is something that started in 2007, I believe, or maybe it was earlier, 90, it might have been 98, 97. Anyway, um, but they've, they've been kind of rigor in rigorous reflection and rigorous um, inclusion. And mm-hmm. so every time there's a new opinion included, they create a process for that to be fully accepted, listened to. And I interviewed one of the um, key members, uh, Invincible is their name, um, and they're an artist as well as an organizer and activist, and one of the most humble people you ever want to meet. And they said that we always begin by listening. Mm. And I felt like sometimes in the Baha'i community growing up, um, and I was 100% guilty of this, I had such, in my teaching approach, I was almost like shoving the quotes down the throat of the people that I was in conversation with and not really doing the deep listening of, mm. of first. And so I think that's part of it. Um, and the other thing I would say, so that, I, that is something, if you're talking about the ideal condition, I would like, I would say that that's one of the things for Baha'i Arts Troupe. But the other one, I came from MIT's co-creation um, studio's big collective wisdom event last uh, fall. And there they did this deep study of what co-creation really looks like and what collective wisdom really looks like historically in the arts and in technology. And they, they showed a piece, a film that was created by the Haagai community in Canada. This is an indigenous community, about 150 people that wanted to preserve their language and, and to, only seven people still spoke the language that were all elders and why. Wow. And so in order to do that, after much, much consultation, they decided making a film in the language was one step towards that. Oh. And, and having the entire community be part of making that film, writing oh. it, everything. So they were able to create a collaborative artistic process that normally when you do a lot of collaborative artistic processes kind of denigrate into like the lowest common denominator of skill and the mastery and the excellence. And a lot of times in the Baha'i arts, that kind of was one of my frustrations is that, you know, I would get two easy claps as an artist. It would not push me to reach my own potential because um, I didn't feel like there was enough, you know, uh, loving critique in the Baha'i arts, if you will. And there, they were able to find a level. level. They did not sacrifice mastery and beauty. And they, I mean, they had non-actors acting. They had brand new people learning how to... I mean, they did have a professional DP and they had a professional director, but everybody else learned and did capacity building. And they were able to maintain mastery and inclusion. Um, so there's some kind of combination of those two that... I think when we get to, when we see Baha'i arts that can truly kind of contribute to the conversation in a way that's going to get out of our own bubble, that those are elements or characteristics of it that I see would be. And, I, and I, I think too, we're living in a world where uh, there's all these silos and there's so much rancor between groups and belief groups, and uh, everyone is broken up into smaller and smaller tribes. A lot of it because of the internet, because. We have these little bubbles that we live in on our Facebook and our Twitter and we echo them and mirror them. The arts have, the arts are the only thing that have the ability to bring really diverse people together, Mm -hmm. you know, and you see that at concerts, you know, (laughs) you do, you do. You go to a Beyonce concert and you're seeing old people and young people and black people and white people and every race under the sun and people, um, all united by the music Mm -hmm. itself. So I think we're going to get to a point when humanity's hunger for the arts is is so great because it's the only thing that will alleviate all the suffering of disunity. And also my, I used to have this talk I gave on the arts and the Baha'i, you know, my understanding of the arts as a Baha'i. And, you know, the if, if the purpose of life is to know and to love God and to carry forth an ever advancing civilization and to develop virtues, all three of those are, the arts are essential for all three of those. One, we know that um, when you really pursue the arts in an authentic way, it is a path to, to, to know and to love yourself, which is part of a, a way of getting to know and to love God in terms of we, we see God in each other, we are attracted to the God-like qualities in each other. And the arts is the place where you have the expertise in the human condition. It is where we have catharsis. It's where we break open the soul and allow those things to shine um, unhindered so that we can see God-like qualities in action. It is a creative process. It's not something that 
is um, an intellectual process. It's a, it's a flow state process that creates another level of transcendence connection and, and knowledge generation, which mm -hmm. is not a mm -hmm. rational or logical one, but it is one that is a fundamental, uh, brings realities into, into consideration for the world to wrestle with and, and to advance uh, in com as we unpack it. So that's knowing and loving God is part of it. Um, carrying forth an ever advancing civilization, like, you know, a lot of the work that I'm doing right now is with speculative narrative and kind of, you know, kind of collective design around speculative narratives of the future. And like, for example, I was in Kansas City, um, where... Uh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Well, <laughs> actually, it was great. I had I'm a good, kidding, good time. <laughs> but... Um, I had worked with Sundance. We did a world building institute with USC. Well, we were at the World Building Institute at USC with a, a collaborative of artists, technologists, scientists, policymakers that did a speculative future um, around what does work look in L like in LA in 2037. And through that process, we had to kind of create you know stories, virtual reality experiences, um, artificial intelligence, you know integrations into journalism and documentary, like all these different things. But what resulted out of it was this incredible vision around, you know, what, like one of the big ahas that came out of it is that the future of work is emotional labor. So, and that came through an artistic process. What that, does that mean? Um, so, and this is something that was, you know, the guy that created self-driving cars for Uber agreed with, which was like, okay, I guess we're onto something because we had a panel about it at Sundance. But basically, if, if the robots and the AI are able to handle the kind of repetitive tasks, um, the things that are... Uh, kind of the nitty-gritty labor that, whether it's digital or manual, it allows us, it frees human beings to do things like caregiving, um, you know, being in, in time and in space with community, being in time and real space with your family members and, and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 like, let's say in the, in the world of medical, the medical field, a doctor right now is almost like a robot, right? They're trying yeah. to do analysis. Yeah. They have time limits. They're You've trying to... eight minutes per patient. Per patient. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's ridiculous. Well, you now have AI that can predict things like... Um, they can look at, you know, scans of uh, MRIs or, or X-rays or CAT scans, and they, within seconds even, can diagnose things mm -hmm. that might have taken uh, a doctor or, and, it, and his team or her team or their team a lot longer. To, so now there's more time that frees up the doctor to do more of the emotional labor, which they've also proven that the more emotional labor goes into time with the patient like there's even this one group that's uh, got there's some hospitals are now hiring storytellers to write the biographies of each patient because when the doctor reads their biography they their um their effectiveness in care goes up like some percentage because no they, kidding. they care more about the actual person in front of them wow so that's like one example of how ai freezes up to be more about the emotional labor so you know, the way in which the arts itself allows us to know and to love God, the way in which it helps with the advancement and the ideation and the knowledge generation about how we're advancing humanity. And then the third is virtues, right? Okay. So I can't, I mean, this is a thought that I had when I was in high school, but I was like, you know, if this world is a journey of us to develop in mind the, the virtues in our own souls, you know, that comes through experience and tests and through, hmm. you know, practices, you know, and not, we can't all have all the possible test experiences that might help us to, you know, mine those gems or polish those, that gold in terms of our virtues. But through the arts, I get an hour and a half of watching a certain film and I've gone on an emotional journey that has taught me something about an aspect of my own virtue, virtue mm -hmm. that I, mm -hmm. I now have, to have access to in a way that I didn't before I saw that film or went to that play or saw that piece of art. Mm -hmm. So it, I think the arts itself is a way of us kind of crowdsourcing the, the virtue development within each person. Oh, wow, yeah, it increases compassion. And it, and it allows you to, like, you know, you, they, I mean, like, I'm on the Center for Advanced Virtualities board at MIT, and they have proven neurologically that, you know, like particularly in virtual reality, if you've gone through a certain kind of experience with a certain fidelity in virtuality, neurologically you've gone through that experience, whether you physically did or not. Yeah, there's a there's a woman uh, here in like Santa Monica, I completely forget her name, but is doing a lot of this VR work where she mm. did um, virtual reality, which for those who don't know is when you you put on a mask and it kind of creates a, a 3D simulation as if as if you're there and gloves too as if you're interacting in another environment um, but she did it like uh, in a refugee camp so that you're in a Jordanian refugee camp and and it's really like you're there among the people and that it increases 
you know, psychologically and scientifically increases your capacity for, for empathy for those people, um, you know. It is. It's a tricky one. The, uh, <laughs> the empathy machine. It, it, yes and no. Yes. Going through these experiences does allow us to access experiences that are going to heighten our ability to um, understand certain experiences and develop certain virtues. The, there is a, a line, though, that needs to be uh, articulated and, and respected. Um, around, like, you know, there was a kind of an attitude in virtual reality. Palmer Luckey, who created the Oculus Rift, um, had made a statement that The Guardian published. He said, uh, you know, it's a moral imperative that we create virtual reality so that, you know, because no one, everyone in the world is never going to be able to get all the great things that the world has to offer. So through virtual reality, they can, like he said, Chinese workers and people in Africa can have get at least some semblance of the experience of what how great we have it here in California. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So there's a wow. little, there's a little bit of a a, a patronizing oh, yeah, like that's... kind of like a, a a privileged safari into poverty oh or God. a privileged safari into trauma that we have to be careful not to fall into. And then there's that patronizing kind of trauma tourism that you yes. could do, like kind of oh I'm gonna do a VR trip into where people are starving yes. and like oh I feel so good about myself <laughs> yes. that I went and visited them and yeah and and meanwhile I'm gonna drive my Prius home and sip my latte on my way home and, and feel bad for those poor people. <laughs> exactly. and, then, and no action. And no, no action. action. No change. Yeah. Um, and so it's almost like a satiation and a kind of an opiate of actual action rather than, because people kind of go through the catharsis of crying and, and then they feel like they've done something when they actually haven't. So there's a, there's a whole kind of body of work around um, empathy is important, but compassion is, is something that actually moves from just empathy to action. To action. Um, which is, a, a, you know, obviously a, a goal that um, this work can't just be about exposure. It has to be about, you know, actual change. And that's a, a bit of a more rigorous process. So you were talking before about AI. And I know Ruha Benjamin does a lot of work on this kind of future speculation and how it... Uh, intersects with with race and, and with prejudice and with uh, racism mm -hmm. and uh, how a lot of like biases carry forward into that work so I know you do a lot of uh, work in that space as well can you tell us about that yes definitely so I got a commission from the Ford Foundation back in 2016 to explore equality how do we further equality in emerging media which includes AI um, you know, immersive media, uh, I, you know, Internet of Things and bioengineering and all these kinds of... I mean, honestly, if you go down this rabbit hole, it is some crazy reality-disrupting stuff that's coming from these advancements in science and technology. And I won't black mirror you guys right now, but it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it was, woo. Anyway, because um, I had a front-row seat as this kind of outsider turned insider into the tech world... Um, I got a front row seat, like, the, you know, the first Oculus Rift, uh, the very prototype was brought to Sun, was made to bring Nuno de la Pena, the godfather of VR, her work, a godmother of VR, uh, to bring her work to Sundance in 2012. So, and I was in the room when Palmer Lucky, who created the Oculus Rift, was like a 19, 20 year old intern for her. And, you know, they had, he had, they couldn't bring the USC $50,000 VR headset off campus. So he said, oh, maybe we could do it with a phone. And that was the prototype for the Oculus Rift, which, you know, got $2 million off of Kickstarter, $2 billion from Facebook, and then exploded the whole kind of secondary gold rush around VR, because it's a 40-year-old medium, it's not new, but it's um, it started kind of the second gold rush. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, I had a front row seat to, I mean, I literally was the person from 7 in the morning till, you know, 11 at night in meetings and giving personal tours to venture capitalists, heads of studios, heads of tech companies, um, uh, you know, heads of philanthropy foundations, and then, you know, everything in between, Black Lives Matter activists. You know, like we just had like this incredible array. We went from having a 4,000 person exhibition at the festival in a 10 day period, the New Frontier section at Sundance, to 25,000 people Holy pushing moment. in to this one, we had 50 pieces. So for those who don't know, the Sundance is a film festival. There's also a Sundance lab, um, but there's other aspects to Sundance. So this is what you're talking yeah. about. That, is yeah. the digital media so Sundance, side of it? Sundance from the beginning has always been multi-platform. Like we've had a theater program since the beginning. Mm -hmm. We used to have a dance program. <laughs> it kind of fell off mm -hmm. in the 90s. But but um, so Redford's mission was always supporting independent storytellers. Obviously, film, it, him coming from film and also film just having the gravitational pull that it has, it became uh, the, the central 
focus of our brand film, but it's always been multi-platform. So Shari Frila, who's the chief curator of New Frontier and the founder, she saw in 2007 that the, the media landscape was changing. You had YouTube starting, you had social media, you had people experimenting with immersive you know, installation and art and film were starting to merge together. So she decided to create this space called the New Frontier Exhibition at Sundance to create a space for those storytellers to show their experiments and their prototypes and, and new ways of storytelling. Um, and I got a chance to be one of the first fellows of the inaugural lab that they created for mm. New Frontier Artists in 2011 mm. with a project called Question Bridge Black Males, which created a transmedia documentary, interactive documentary and art project to facilitate a mass conversation among black men in America. That went to the lab in 2011, went to the festival in 2012, and by the end of 2012, I was running it. <laughs> oh, my I was, goodness. I was running the, the lab, and Shari was still running mm -hmm. the public programs and the exhibition. So it put me into an environment of just thousands of incredibly innovative, incredibly... Uh, you know, artists that were trying not just to, to like use the new gizmo to make something cool to look at, but really trying to do what Michelle Satter, the you know one of the founders of Sundance and my boss who created the feature film program at Sundance, she sat me down my first day and she said, okay, your job is to find artists that make meaning. And it took me two years before I even understood what she meant by that. Wow. I, I what thought, does that mean? Exactly. Like, I thought she meant, oh, artists that are doing meaningful work. They're doing work about, you know, you know refugees. They're doing work about, you know, civil rights. It wasn't until two years later, I was, I was sitting in a matinee of Fault in Our Stars, of all films, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> By myself. And my mom had gone through a cancer battle, yeah. uh, not two, you know, in a, like a couple years before. And, and when you're caretaking someone in cancer, it's like, can I get your tea? Do you need to take a shower? You know, are you feeling nauseous today? Do you need your medicine? It's very pedestrian. It's not, you may die tomorrow. Right. And <laughs> yeah. this is what she meant to me. Like, it, you kind of yeah. keep that... As, it kind of almost in this like very, not robotic, but very practical yeah. headspace. Yeah. But it was in that film that the weight of my entire relationship with my mom and the full meaning of our relationship, her life, my life, our work in the world, our purpose hit me and like a, it just like fell into my soul and I just weeped like I couldn't, I mean, just weeped, 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 such a huge catharsis. And I realized, I was like, I didn't even understand all those little tiny movements, those little, here's your coffee, here's your whatever none of that really had meaning for me or the meaning of it didn't have context for me until I went through that artistic experience to help me contextualize the oh, meaning. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that's so, I mean, if you look at the history of science and technology and the advancements on that side, because, you know, the writings talk about the arts and sciences are the two wings that advance civilization. And so that's an intersection. It's, a, it's an intersection. Right, what we were doing at Sundance. But the arts, the sciences and the technologies, they will disrupt reality, but then they'll just leave it hanging out there. Right. You know? The artists come and they contextualize the meaning of that for a lived experience. They give it a spiritual compass. A spiritual compass, exactly. So, so anyway. how, does ra how does race factor into this? That's, so, that's oh yeah, that was work. your that, question. That was the original question. <laughs> So, uh, so anyway, I was working for the Ford Foundation um, oh, and yes, doing, grants, this, yeah. doing this big uh, review of equality in emerging media and um, essentially saw the, with my own eyes the same replications of injustice and inequity start to replicate itself. In oh, these yeah. new, like I had a conversation with, here's an example. Um, Back in the early days of VR and AR, there was a, a super kind of eclectic, diverse group of people. Um, our very first VR exhibition was 60 plus percent women, people of color, and, and queer folks. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it was diverse. That same year, Facebook had its first developers conference for the Oculus. Out of 150,000 people that were developing for it, they picked, hand picked 1,000 of them. I went to the Lowe's Hotel in Hollywood, walked into this thing. And I was one of maybe 30 women and maybe, what? maybe, I, maybe I saw 10 black people there. Wow. And I just was like, and this was the hand picked. So I don't think that represented the 150,000. It represented the hand picked. And so at that plenary session, a woman from LEVR stood up and said, Hey, so what are we going to do about the apparent gender gap? And she got basically shut down from the executives on the stage that said, look, we have to get $2 billion return on investment. We cannot play gender politics. This is a meritocracy. The best of the best is what we need, and the best of the best is represented in this room. Hmm. And that was 
one, the <laughs> argument that Silicon Valley keeps making, it's the same argument that Hollywood made. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. it's it's complete BS. Mm-hmm, <laughs> you know, like mm-hmm. we have the statistics to prove. Well, luckily when Hollywood, now we know because they finally started making films by different identity groups, you see, oh shoot, the audience really does go to see. Yeah. I mean, look at the box office numbers. Actually, the, the UCLA Bunch Center found that the more diverse the cast, the stronger the revenue numbers for yep. all across yep. the board. So, so, so tech had still not quite. But and then just recently this year, Slate um, there was released a, a study of the most rigorous diversity study in Silicon Valley and the entire tech field, and they found that. That meritocracy and pipeline argument is complete BS because they found outside of Silicon Valley much more diversity, a lot of talent. Anyway, long story short, you know, that was like one thing that I saw and I was like, oh, okay, this is a real problem. <laughs> and then, you know, I met with Sepp Kamvar from MIT and Google, and he was like, code is the new superpower, code designs a social process, and that designs our world. And he, if you look at like, you know, ride sharing and green space or Airbnbs, that and, and real estate or you look at food trucks and Twitter like you just write the code it creates a social process and we change our behavior to physically change our world and when you look at the statistics of who's writing that code it's all very homogenous right yeah. and so that's a problem and it's not state regulated it's not nationally regulated sure. it's something that is within the hands of super corporations so that's a problem and then I went to um Google and I met with Robert Wong at the Google Creative Lab and he was saying that he fears that we will not be able to design a human-centered future because the artists and the people from the humanities are completely marginalized in the tech world as pairs of hands and not at the table of thought leadership. Ah. Um, and we saw that, that was pre-Cambridge Analytica and pre the uh, whole movement against, like there, Tristan Harris and a number of... So Cambridge of, yeah. Analytica, for those who don't know, was the kind of the evil company that was... Um, buying people's personal data uh, off of from from Facebook and kind of secretly uh, siphoning it off and, and using it for political <laughs> yeah. means Games. as well as yeah. economic. And and also, I mean, the reason I say that is because, like, for example, um, there were uh, studies being made about the design that was happening within Silicon Valley apps and, and the ways in which they create what's called user design, user experience design, that they, these big companies started to understand that they were creating mental health crises and they ignored that on purpose and pushed their developers to continue wow. to design for addiction and to design for things that were creating mental health issues. There was a group of developers that had to that protested and left and created what's called the Center for Humane Technology to counter this kind of addiction. Now, there were, I, I know my, for myself, being an artist in the tech world, there was like, I got a meeting at, I won't say the studio's name, but a huge, one of the biggest studios in the world mm-hmm. with the president. And I was in a meeting where they were talking about um, kind of taking on Netflix style hyper customization. And in the meeting, I, I made the point, I said, look, if you continue to hyper customize to your audience's previous behavior, you're only going to feed them things that they've already seen. And you're, you're losing opportunity to widen their worldview, widen their palette of ideas, um, even to consume your wider catalog, if you're just talking about it from a pure consumer. And why don't you, you know, design into the algorithm a wild card? Like if they're watching all heterosexual rom-coms, throw in transparent, just so they have something to have to contend with and widening their sense of what the diversity of the world and ideas are. And they basically looked at me like I was this, you know, nonprofit Sundance, doesn't care about business, yeah. you know, attitude, even though I have a master's in business. And, and they kind of sh- shooed me away. Well, not even four years later, we see what yeah. happens with filter bubbles and echo chambers and the divisiveness of it. Mm-hmm. So that's what I mean by why we need to create an intersection to try to mitigate this. So that's like a bigger picture of why it's important for art, science, technology, and morality to be in conversation as we're wielding these exponential powers of technology, but particularly around race. And this is the last thing I'll say, I know we're over time. Um, We, (laughs) these algorithms are particularly insidious around historical data. Um, They take historical data and they use that to do things like predictive policing. Um, they do that, like for example, there was a whole thing about Google searches 
when you put in, if you're a woman, they, they know these, these kind of uh, business intelligence or these intelligence systems around these algorithms know if you're pregnant before you're pregnant based on your activities in the digital space. They know if you're gay before you know you're gay around your, I mean, they know so much about you. On mm-hmm. a deep psychological level, they know your transactions, they know where you go, they know everything. And there's so much, even your own DNA that you're shedding on the streets. We had one of our artists that picked up fingernails and cigarette butts and just random things off the street and was able to do a full ancestral and health analysis of those strangers' oh DNA. Oh my gosh. She was able to use the FBI DNA profiling system to 3D print their faces. Oh my gosh. And if you're talking about a world of omnipresent facial recognition technology, there's privacy breach. And she was able to pretend to be them on 23andMe and talk to their people. To their relatives. Oh, my God. She she was able to break through to find Facebook pages and homes. And she was able to clone their tissues. What? (laughs) You're talking about like... From a cigarette butt. From a cigarette butt. From a fingernail. From gum. Yeah. So this is when we talk about, so this is the level of, I mean, that's not even, that's, that was five years ago that she did that project. I don't even know where things are at now. And then when you talk about um, DNA itself being code, like now you can put, you know, films and email servers and all onto DNA molecules. And now even Caltech last summer was able to create a DNA molecule that is uh, an artificial intelligence. So we're creating smart organic matter without a sperm and an egg. Whoa. Like, this stuff You're is You're blowing so, my I, mind, Sinclair. I'm telling you. But my point is that these are, it's like splitting open the atom. Yeah. You know, who was at the, who was at the table when they split open the atom and said, oh, how are we going to wield this power? Yeah. That's where we are at. And, and Ruha is saying we cannot allow, like in the case of predictive policing, they're taking biased data from a, a, a system um, that w- works to contr- do social control, particularly of black men, and using that to do unbiased analysis of where to send police to likely mitigate crime. And that's wow. going to be in black and brown neighborhoods. Wow. Wow. Well, this is, you know, this is where it all boils down to, you know, why I'm a Baha'i is because I feel like all of these technologies, you know, all of the, all of the, outlets for science they need a uh, they need a spiritual guide a spiritual and moral guide uh, as much as that is a kind of un pc thing to say today because that when you say morality people recoil and they wonder like who well who's morality but you know baha'u'llah's morality god's morality um where you know like you talked about gaming um you know relying you know they they have psychologists on the board of these apps and these games that in the laboratories to try and figure out how to make them more addictive and uh you you mentioned that and referenced that earlier and the pharmaceutical companies uh can control the addictiveness of the drugs that they that they put out there and they knew perfectly well that oxycontin was three times more addictive than heroin and consistently said the fake news of like it's less addictive than heroin even though the studies had proven otherwise in Purdue and other of these companies so you have these uh, you know pharma tech and digital tech and you know it's going to come out with with AI but unless all of these forces uh, have a, a, a spiritual guidepost towards the betterment of humanity towards uh, connection towards collaboration towards service and a, a kind of humility and um, also that spiritual guide towards beauty that you've been talking about uh, from future architects. Humanity is, is really going to be screwed. Um, I just noticed like with my son who's 14 and his friends, this is a generation growing up on screens and they're, they're programmed to be addicted to these screens. Uh, everything they look at is, has an algorithm attached to it to get you to use more of that screen. And it's having a great deleterious effect, I think, on these younger generations, on their on their brain development and on their social development and on their spiritual development. Yeah. It, it, part of the challenge is, it's a, is the buy-in factor. Like, my oldest son um, opted out of social media until this year, and he's almost 17. Um, he has autism. He's uh, very high-functioning, like, super genius, but uh, social cues uh, were challenging. And so he never really got why people are on social media in the first mm-hmm. place but 
it put me in a position where he was even further isolated as an autistic person from the social process because everything was being facilitated on social media. Like he couldn't just, it was, it was just such a strange environment in high school where, you know, they're in real life together every day on campus, but their social connections are facilitated in the digital space. Yeah. And so if he wasn't in that digital space, he wasn't aware of what was going on culturally on campus, what the conversation was on campus, who was, you know, what, what things he could possibly even engage in on campus. So he was completely blind to a whole intangible layer of the reality of that school campus culture mm -hmm. unless he got on. Once he got on, his social network expanded. I mean, in real life, because he went to... So it's kind of like one of those things, these are the kinds of choices we're going to have to make, like, you know... But yet, but yeah. yet kids today are feeling more loneliness yeah. than they've ever felt before. They're more connected, and yet they feel more lonely, and... You know, depression, anxiety, and suicidal ideation are through the roof and epidemic proportions. Yep. Um, I've spoken about this before. And a lot of it is is from these technologies and social media. And I use social media. I have mm. a company that's based around social media. Right. Um, we're trying to counteract, you know, these effects <laughs> and try and use it in a positive, uplifting, connected way. But um, but that's what I mean by the opt-in. Like, if, if every... We're, there's going to be a lot more opt-in, opt-out um, opportunities coming forward to us, and we have to make big decisions like, are you going to genetically engineer your children? And if mm -hmm. so, what kind of gap does that make in performance in college? And, and is that a just gap? You know what I mean? Um, if somebody is got, you know, augmentation, I mean, this sounds really crazy, but the truth it's, is... No, it's true. They they already did it in China, and they're, they're talking about using the CRISPR technology to take, you know, uh, multiple sclerosis out of people's uh, DNA or yeah. whatever. And, and to do brain enhancement, yep. performance mm -hmm. enhancement. And there's also things like, you know, um, uh, embeddables in your bodies, that not just wearables, but embeddables and, you know, kind of, you know, AI. Um, that sounds like a snack. <laughs> It might be to take a take a pill New, that has from a, Nestle. Has a nano robot in it. You know, uh -huh. take a pill. The nano robots in your body. I mean, like in 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 the Nordic countries, you know, companies are already um, employees are are okay with having uh, technology embedded in their fingers. Yeah, you know, a, a you chip know, or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And one point that was made by this professor at UCSD, Benjamin B Bratton. I was like, it's not Benjamin Button, Benjamin Bratton. He talks about how we have our physiology exist the way it exists today because we've always been in collaboration with technology like there's n human beings the, the fact that we use the tools we used is why we're able to be the human beings that we are physiologically today and that's not stopping and if you look at Yuval Harari's Homo Deus book you'll mm -hmm. see how that you know there's these incredible opportunities but we really do have to have a real conversation around it's not inevitable that we adopt these technologies we do have a choice, and if we do choose it, how are we choosing it for the greatest good? And I think the main thing that Ruha is talking about, and the main thing that I believe, and I'm evangelizing, if, I know that's not my favorite word, but I'm um, trying to uh, communicate in, in collaboration with this incredible community of thought leaders around this, is we, like previous industrial revolutions were pretty um, homogenous, one like you know group uh, made the decisions about what value systems went into those, usage of that kind of abundant technology at that time and or exponential technology at that time and they left people out like indigenous value systems around stewardship of the environment mm -hmm. if we had and now we're paying the bill of that yes. blind spot mm -hmm. climate change so what are what is the bill of this fourth industrial revolution if we don't create really rigorous democratized imagination of our future and how we wield these technologies well i'm going to go further than that because i don't think it's more i think it's a lot more than democratized imagination of the future and opting in i, I really believe that unfortunately things are going to get a lot worse and we need it we need a spiritual guidepost and um uh you know if it's if it's not based on on, uh, on compassion on unity on service um and really on the principles that baha'u'llah brought then we're screwed. Uh, so I ask every guest to bring their favorite quote. And um, <laughs> you, you've got an interesting one here. <laughs> okay. Talk me through this. Yeah, um, this is from The Seven Valleys and Four Valleys. Um, and it's a super small quote, it's, but it's something that I hold with me a lot. I say be, and it is, and thou, thou shalt say be, and it shall be. Um, 
and there are other quotes in the writings that talk about the power of B and E um, as the letters that come together to create creation, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it also was related to the fashioner of the universe, which is one of the names of God um, in the Baha'i writings. And for me, it my, my father growing up always would talk about how one of the qualities that we reflect as spiritual beings made in the image and likeness of the unknown, the noble essence, God, is that we are creators. Yeah. We, we do bring things into being. Um, and that is something that only our, only we do as creatures on this planet. Mm. Um, and it's a very important responsibility. And I think it's really connected to my identity as an artist and my 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 calling as an artist, and you know, there's another hidden word that talks about those, uh, you know, those um, the best of us are men are those that follow their divine calling and share, you know, back with their family and their community. I'm totally paraphrasing that, but the idea is for me this idea of B and E being knit together to create is as a creation as a creative person as an artist or as a creative scientist or creative technologist. What we do is we tap into an idea. And we bring it into manifestation. We, we, we bring it into being through our actions. Um, and that's a powerful thing. As we saw from all these other conversations around these technologies, it's powerful. You, you don't have to be a Baha'i to do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's, just, it's mm -hmm. part of the human mm -hmm. condition. Um, and, and knowing how to wield that responsibility, um, being thoughtful, like you were saying, about what are the moral implications, the ethical implications, the spiritual implications, the mental health implications of that process, but also where's the courage and being able to bring something into being that hasn't been brought into being before. It is, it takes courage and bravery because it shakes people's, it shakes our status quo, it pushes us to that next advancement and that's not always a smooth and easy process. It takes um, a certain level of courage and bravery to do that. That's so beautiful. I'm, you've brought so much into being, uh, <laughs> Kamal, really. You've, from dance troops to garbage can pounding to you know, virtual reality to this, the future architects uh, and, and the digital media work that you're doing and the social justice work you're doing. Uh, it's been such a pleasure uh, just meeting you and hearing your story. What an incredible story. <laughs> and please, we write like 13 books. <laughs> Seriously. I know you're raising kids and traveling the world and have a full-time job, but there's a lot of different books inside of you, oh. both personal and spiritual and technological and... <laughs> Social, social justice soul. And, uh, I have one called Going Undercover in Bougie Black Atlanta. <laughs> we'll get, that's another story altogether. Okay. okay. But no, right. um, actually one thing I will say uh, is that I'm working with um, an incredible group of producers um, and my brother Robert Sinclair where uh, we got some funding from a couple of sources to start a doc series. Called, we're calling it the Radical Imagination Project. And we're looking at all of these subjects and how the importance of us being able to kind of radically imagine the future so that we can get beyond things like scarcity mentalities and yep. competition yep. to imagine what would the world look like in it when we invest in human potential, when we invest in collaboration, and when we invest in social justice and beauty. So That's beautiful. Thank you so much. And thanks for listening, all 137 of you. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. <laughs> thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to Baha'i Blogcast. Hope you enjoyed the episode and the conversation. Check out more fun Baha'i stuff on Baha'iblog.net. Thank you so much, and good night. <laughs>